Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, second seminar in our newly revamped and virtual incarnation of the Roots to STEM seminar series. We started this series back in late uh, 2019, and the objective was to create a series that recognizes that diversity is critical to maintaining a dynamic and innovative scientific community and also acknowledging that our lived experiences and the paths that we've taken on our academic journeys inform the ways in which we approach scientific challenges. So by promoting inclusion and diversity, we can leverage the richness of our unique experiences to foster a thriving and productive campus community. <clears throat> so today's speaker is someone that I'm very excited to hear from and someone who I think really embodies the spirit of the Roots to STEM seminar series, both through her excellent uh, scientific accomplishments, but also through her advocacy work in promoting diversity within STEM. Uh, so uh, Nadia Mason is a professor of physics at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She earned her PhD in physics from Stanford University and did her postdoctoral research as a junior fellow at Harvard. A condensed matter experimentalist, Dr. Mason focuses on electron behavior in low dimensional materials such as nanowires, graphene, and nanostructured superconductors. In addition to maintaining a rigorous research program in teaching, Dr. Mason works to increase diversity in the physical sciences. Dr. Mason was named a 2008 Emerging Scholar for or by Diverse Issues in Higher Education magazine and was a recipient of the 2009 Denise Denton Emerging Leader Award. Also the 2012 Maria Gopert Meyer Award of the American Physical Society and the 2020 APS Edward Boucher Award, to name just a few. Uh, so <clears throat> with that being said, um, Professor Mason, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I will turn the floor over to you. Great, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here again. Sorry, I can't be here in person, but it's uh, it's nice to, uh, well, I guess, see everyone's names, if not faces right now. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a Pathways to STEM seminar, which I really appreciate the idea of the seminar series. So I thought I'd start with just two, two slides about my own path into, into physics and about my job and the things that I do. And then I'll continue with a um, just a very uh, introductory talk on, on, on quantum physics and measuring quantum devices. Okay, so just to start a little, a little bit about me, um, I grew up in, in New York and, and DC and Houston. I moved around a lot. Um, I didn't have an extremely strong background in science in high school. I was actually very much into athletics. I spent all my time doing gymnastics and then later in track, although I was interested in math. Um, I was good at math and I liked it, but, I, but um, eventually late in high school, I had the opportunity to do some summer research in biochemistry and then later in geophysics. And that's what got me to realize that research was something that I, hands-on research is something I enjoyed and that I could make a career out of it. So I ended up going to college and taking different classes in biology, chemistry, physics, and realized that only physics um, explained things the way that made sense to me. <laughs> so chemistry is terrible until we got to physical chemistry and then it totally made sense. I realized, oh, I'm a physicist at heart. So I ended up majoring in physics. Um, again, um, classes weren't that fun. They were fine. I learned a lot, but really summer internships were the things that propelled me to want to continue in physics, um, researching over the summers, especially in programs that were specified for women and underrepresented minorities that I could find cohorts. And um, I just had a lot of opportunities through those programs So really, really valued those sort of summer programs and benefited a lot from them. Um, I went on to center for my PhD on 2D superconductors, uh, did a postdoc at Harvard, as was mentioned, um, had my first kid as my last year as a postdoc. Uh, came to Illinois in 2005, working on topics that combined what I'd done in my graduate work and in my postdoc work. Um, had another kid three three years in, so I ended my six year tenure clock with uh, two kids under six, which wasn't easy, but it was okay. Managed, um, and then I became a full professor in 2016, and the kids are old. Um, they're all teenagers, so that's uh, that's some basics of, of just my personal path. And I'd be happy to say more about this at the end if anyone. I actually have a whole slide on advice about thriving in STEM um, at the end of this talk if you want to say ask more about it. But just to give a sense of also, you know, now I'm a physics professor, and I know especially 
undergraduates often don't have a sense of what physics faculty do because you only see us teaching classes, which is a big part of what we do. But here I've just listed some of the stuff I've done in the past about nine years or 10 years. So um, we mentor, we have, I have a lot of graduate students that work in my research lab. I do hands-on research that they do the real work. Um, I've mentored over 20 undergrads, postdocs, high school students, high school teachers. I've taught classes at all levels, written a lot of papers, given over hundred invited talks in the past nine years, written a lot of grants, um, do service to the field. So there's on, a, on a decadal study for all of materials research, looking at what happened in the past and our plans for the future, boards of, of journals. Um, I was in the leadership of the American Physical Society, which is our big disciplinary society. Um, I currently serve as director of the Illinois Materials Research Science and Engineering Center. That's an interdisciplinary center that has about 30 faculty from across fields, about over 100 people all together, including graduate students and undergraduates, um, and has a huge outreach and education um, component to it as well. And I've also just done a lot of service to the community, especially um, working, you know, trying to promote inclusivity and equity. So chair of the American Physical Society Committee on, Minority, on Minorities, on the Illinois Gender Equity Council, a lot of talks about, about diversity and inclusivity. And then just, you know, some of the outreach things like I was on TV on a Wise Guys segment, did about 50 of those in the past couple of years. Um, I gave a TED talk last year. So um, this is just a, a sampling of some of the things that, that, that I've done. I think it's, it's, you know, maybe representative of faculty who are, who've been around for 15 years like I have. Um, it's, it's really crazy. There's a lot of things here, but it's also really interesting, engaging and exciting. And I want to point out that for me, research is integral, but also so are outreach, inclusion, and, and service. And so all of these things are extremely important to me, and I consider part of my core mission as a physicist and worth spending my time on, as much as I have time. <laughs> okay, so I could say more about all of these at the end, but right now I want to spend the rest, next 30 minutes approximately saying a little bit more about the research that I do in quantum physics, and generally about quantum mechanics in general. So uh, this talk is titled Through the Quantum Tunnel. And I was inspired to give this talk on watching Ant-Man and the Wasp a few years ago. I don't know if anyone's seen this, this movie, but um, if you saw it, you noticed that, and actually I rewatched it, which is you know, what we do during COVID times, we just rewatch movies. Right? <laughs> and so and if, you, if you see it again, you note that, that um, quantum mechanics is around a lot. I mean, the, the, the whole core of the movie is around building what's called the quantum tunnel. And I know you can see my mouse, but this is this is the quantum tunnel. Um, and then, as a as a core element of this movie, they have um, the main character going going through the quantum tunnel. And I'll play this for you. Oh, it's getting small. Warning: approaching quantum void. Okay, so you could hear him approaching the quantum void and Ant-Man and the Wasp. And so, you know, that's not the, that's not exactly what, what I talk, what we talk about in physics when we deal with quantum tunnels and quantum void. I will say what that is, but, um, you know, it, it's there. It's, it's and any publicity is good publicity, as they say. Right? And actually, even there's another character called Ava who has been, who's been um, influenced by this quantum void and she exhibits properties of quantum mechanics, including superposition and going through barriers that you normally can't go through. And so here's, Here's an example of her. You can see that there's there's kind of two of her as a barriers. You don't so uh so so that's just an example of a uh, of um where we see quantum these days, even even if it's not exactly what we think about, you know, what is the real quantum is a question that I want to answer. Um and also there's just a lot of quantum in the news. These are articles just from a few years ago. But you know, Google has, has is building a quantum computer. IBM is building a quantum computer. Um, there's a lot of industry and, and government who are scared because China is building quantum communications in space and back. Um, there's a lot of competition worldwide to build the next, the next big quantum computer. Um, you know, partly because of this, there's a lot of discussion about needing people to work in quantum computing. This is an article from just a few years ago about the tech talent shortage. In quantum computing, and then there's all sorts of quantum startups building, you know, all of these in quantum exchange, Quibitech, okay, encryption and computing. Uh, one of my most recent graduate students uh, left not to, you know, my, a previous graduate student went to work for IBM in their quantum computing group, and then my most recent graduate student left to work in Rigetti, or graduated to work in Rigetti, which is another private quantum computing company. And so these things are popping up all over the place. Um, and part of, you know, and the government has been responding. In fact, just um, 
two years ago, Trump signed the National Quantum Initiative Act. And I'm sorry, this text is really too small to read, but uh, basically it defines quantum science as storage, transmission, manipulation, or measurement of information encoded, encoded in systems that can be described by the laws of quantum physics. So I'm not sure they really know in this, in this document what quantum either, but they just basically say, you know, we're giving money to things that are quantum. Okay, <laughs> anything about quantum physics. That's $1.2 billion, that's, that's a lot of money. And more locally here at Illinois, we have the Illinois Quantum Information Science and Technology Center, IQUIST, which just started um, a couple years ago. Um, it, the purpose of this center is to accelerate quantum information science and engineering here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It was a $15 million investment from the university. There's already been over $30 million in external grants that were gotten by people as part of, of IQUIST. And so there's lots of centers forming here, 40 faculty across disciplines, there's a larger Chicago quantum exchange with the University of Chicago Northwestern that this is part of. And, and there's also opportunities for graduates and undergraduates to research as part of IQUIST. So I encourage you to go to the IQUIST website and see what they're about. Okay, so all of this is just, I hope, a clear motivation that, that quantum really is everywhere. Okay, it's, it's, it's here at Eric Urbana Champagne, it's in Chicago, it's in the media, it's in, it's in movies. Um, quantum is big. So now let's go through, you know, if quantum is so big, then what is it, right? I wanna fill in today some of the gaps about what we mean when we talk about quantum and then give some examples of how we study quantum. I'll give examples from my own research about studying quantum electronic devices. Okay, so quantum mechanics is the theory that describes nature at the smallest scales. Okay, so here's an ant and there's a person. Actually, it's even smaller scales than this, okay? So it's not even at the, at the minuscule honey, I shrunk the kid scale. It's at the, you know, this is again from Ant-Man and the Wasp, the sort of weird, we don't really know what's going on. We can't see it, but there's something down there scale, okay? So it's, it's the smallest scales of, of atoms, of electrons, things at a billionth of a meter or smaller, basically. And it's also, a, you know, this is a realm that we, we can't see directly by eye and weird things happen. It's actually a very confusing part of physics. It's a confusing realm to study. And as an example of that, some of the people who developed quantum mechanics in the very beginning were confused by it. It has things that are incongruous that's hard to keep in our head at the same time. So for example, John Wheeler, one of the original architects of quantum mechanics said, if you're not completely confused by quantum mechanics, you do not understand it. Um, and then Edward, Edmund, Ed, Ed Erwin Schrodinger, who again, you know, developed the, one of the fundamental theories of quantum mechanics said about quantum mechanics, I do not like it and I'm sorry I ever had anything to do with it. Okay, so this is just an example of how confusing this theory is. So if you find yourself thinking about quantum mechanics and being confused by it, understand that you're not alone and the architects of the whole theory thought that it was strange and confusing. Okay, so what are some of the basic principles of quantum? Well, there's this guy, Max Planck, in the early 1900s. Most of this theory is developed between 1900 and 1930, say. Um, Max Planck was actually commissioned by electric companies to try to produce brighter bulbs at lower energy. So a lot of people were motivated by practical considerations. But when he was trying to understand the energy that was produced by light, he realized that electromagnetic energy is not continuous. So if you have light, it's not just a continuous wave or energy or something. It actually comes in small packets or quanta, right? And these quanta are defined by E equals HF, where H is what's called the Planck constant after Planck. It's 6.6 .6 on 10 to minus 34 joule seconds. And F is the frequency, okay? And this EHF is the minimum packet of electromagnetic energy of which light is a part. And you may wonder, well, why did no one notice it before? And you can see, well, this scale of 10 to the minus 34 is really small. Okay, so it's hard to see that energy scale within, you know, in, in everyday room temperature things. And yet it comes out when you're trying to understand how atoms work, how light is emitted, all sorts of other things. And again, you know, Planck didn't just come up with this theory randomly. He didn't just say like, oh, this is a good idea. He thought it was a weird idea. And he actually said that understanding radiation via energy quantization was, quote, an act of despair, okay, because he couldn't explain it any other way. And so this is an example of, as you think about how theories come about and how people come up with things, he didn't want, he, th he thought this was a crazy idea, but nothing else worked. And finally, he was ready to, quote, sacrifice any of his previous convictions about physics. And so here's an example of when you think about quantum, even the people who developed it had to throw out what they thought they knew in order to develop this new theory of how things actually work at the small scale. 
Okay, so light comes in packets of E times HF, okay? And then Einstein came along in 1905 and said, well, it's not just that the minimum energy of light is some packet, but actually light is made of particles with tiny amounts of energy given by HF. And Einstein found this by looking at experiments where you hit, you hit a piece of metal with light and a single electron popped out. And you could compare the energy of the light going in with the electron popping out. And you could only explain it by saying that light was a particle with a tiny amount of energy. And of course, these particles we now say are photons. Okay. I mean, actually, Einstein was given the Nobel Prize for this work on the photoelectric effect and understanding photons, not for his gravitational theory, which was actually way too far out there to get a Nobel Prize for, and so, or even, even, or even for relativity, so, uh, or for general relativity. So for, for part of, partly this theory is why he got the Nobel Prize. Okay, so light is a particle, but we also know that light's a wave. We talk about electromagnetic waves, about radiation as a wave, right? You think if we talk about heat waves, there's a reason for that, because heat is a wave. Okay, but now I'm telling you that all of these things are particles. So is it both a particle and a wave? The answer is yes. Okay. So that's number one crazy thing about quantum mechanics, that, that light is a particle and a wave at the same time. So what do we, what do we mean by this, right? We mean, we mean that, you know, when you think of a particle, it's localized in space and time, things like a basketball, right? Or little pebbles and particles can't seem to pass through each other. Okay. On the other hand, Waves are things that spread out in space and time. Think of water waves and how they propagate through space. They're oscillations, they have a wavelength, they have a frequency, and they can be superimposed on each other, right? If you see two waves of water come together, they don't just, they don't just lock and stop, they actually interfere. You get a bigger wave coming in and then they continue out on the other side. So waves can be superimposed, show interference effects and pass through each other, okay? And the idea of something being a particle and a wave at the same time is something that the architects of quantum mechanics even had trouble understanding, right? It's not something we have direct experience with. You know, in my field, it's kind of like chicken and waffles. You know, in my intuition, they don't go together. But then you do the experiment and it's really delicious, okay? So quantum mechanics is similarly delicious and, and even more useful than, than chicken and waffles, although they're good, you should try it. Okay, so, so in quantum mechanics, it was discovered that light is a wave. This was discovered in like the 16 and 1700s, way long time ago. They showed that it interfered, okay? But then Einstein comes along and says, light is a particle, okay? And then even more crazy, de Broglie comes along in 1924, about 20 years later and says, okay, it's not just light. All matter has both wave and particle properties, right? Light's just another element of matter and everything is both a wave and a particle. You, me, basketballs, atoms, light. Okay, so now this is seeming crazy, right? So, you know, we, we, have, we have something like, you know, this, this Ava from, from, from the Ant-Man and the Wasp, and now you see this is why she's moving around all over. She's superimposed and interfering with herself, okay? So now you think, okay, well, if, if we're waves, then shouldn't we do this? Shouldn't we interfere with ourselves and show all these properties? You can ask, okay, well, then what is, what is our wavelength, right? And I don't mean our wavelength, okay? <laughs> What's our wavelength if we're a wave? You can calculate this um, using this uh, a formula that shows our wavelength is related to Planck's constant over our momentum. And at our energy scales, our wavelength is something like 10 to the minus 36 meters, okay? For comparison, an atom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. Okay, so this tells us our wavelength is really, really, really small. And that's why we don't see any interference effects at, you know, at our sizes. And in fact, you know, you know, so you wouldn't see, you wouldn't see Ava actually interfere because that wavelength is way too small. But if you take an object that's really, really, really small, then that wavelength becomes comparable to the object and you can start seeing interference. So you wouldn't see interference with us even though we do have a wavelength, but when you get down to atoms and electrons, then you should be able to see it. Okay. So that's number one about quantum mechanics. Everything is a particle and a wave and things like electrons and atoms can interfere with themselves, okay? Now, another corollary of this idea of particles as waves is that because waves extend through space, you can no longer define particles as having just one property, okay? So you can't say that they have either a location or a momentum or just one thing at the same time because they have them both right, as both particles and waves. So 
What quantum mechanics ends up using is a language of probability theory to describe the outcome of measurements. Because you have multiple properties of these, you give a probability of something being in one location at one time and a probability of something having a particular energy. You know, this is, uh, I don't know if you guys know of, of Schrodinger's cat idea. This is, I mean, maybe you've seen t-shirts and stuff, right? Schrodinger's cat can be both dead and alive because there's a probability of, of, of uh, you know, an atom hitting a vial of poison and opening it. So this is the Schrodinger vet saying, I have both good news and bad news. <laughs> okay. Now, another, another um, corollary of this idea of, of, of light being both, par of particles having both wave and particle properties is that an observer can't observe a microscopic system without altering some of its properties. It's kind of like how you can't test your tire's air pressure without removing some of the air, right? But at the same time, an observer can't predict how the state of a system is going to change. And the interesting corollary of that is that if you have two particles that are related to each other, they call them entangled together, their properties are the same, and you don't observe them, right? And you just move them far apart, then you don't know, they can still have properties that are related to each other, even if they're moved apart further than they can communicate. Okay, as long as we don't observe them, they can still have properties that are related. So the measurement of one relates to the measurement of the other, right? And this is what's used for quantum cryptography, for example. That's one of the crazy things about quantum mechanics. So as Lawrence Krauss, his author says, at the heart of quantum mechanics, the rule that sometimes governs politicians and CEOs, as long as no one is watching, anything goes. Okay. So as long as all you don't measure it, you can move things far apart and they can still remain entangled and have their properties. They're still governed by some probability. And uh, again, it's not intuitive, but it's true, right? It works for, for this theory, not just for theory, but it works practically. We make stuff out of these. Okay, so just to summarize some of the basics of quantum mechanics, uh, the first idea is that quantum particles can act as both particles and waves, this wave-particle duality. Uh, the next idea is that quantum mechanics uses the language of probability theory to describe the outcome of measurements. Okay, so it's not that this is, it's, it's likely to be some way. Third is that an observer cannot observe a microscopic system without altering some of its properties. Okay, neither one can predict how the state of the system will change. And finally, we have quantization of the energy of microscopic particles. So this is just a summary of some of the basics of quantum mechanics. Now I want to move on to talking about quantum devices. Again, it's because this is something that I do and also to give you a specific idea of how we measure these quantum, part, quantum properties in real systems, okay? And when I talk about quantum devices, I'll mostly be talking about these two aspects of quantum mechanics because these are the most relevant for studying quantum um, solid state quantum devices, wave particle duality and this quantization. And I'll go on to show some examples of where this shows up. Okay, so we just talked about quantum, and now I'm going to go on to electronic devices. Okay, so what does quantum have to do with electronic devices? Well, when I talk about electronic devices, I'm talking about electrons, okay, electronic electrons. You know, electrons, you know, or electrons are the things that flow from a battery to a light bulb, turn it on, and then flow back the other terminal of the battery. We classically think of these as tiny charged particles that carry an electrical current in materials. And the simplest electronic circuit just looks like this. Here's a resistor, here's a voltage, a battery, and you know the current comes out, goes through the resistor. You get a, an electric current flowing per unit time where the current is proportional to the number of electrons. Okay, so here's where we think of electrons as particles. Okay, however, just like every other small particle, they're also waves. And as de Broglie said, you know, all matter has a wave-like nature, so electrons can be wave-like. And in fact, this has been confirmed by electron interference and diffraction experiments. So we think of electrons as these little things moving through our wires, turning on our light bulbs, but they can also interfere with each other just like waves do. Okay, so electrons are both particles and waves, and that's been measured experimentally. Okay, so why and when do the properties of electrons matter? Well, it matters when the devices are made very small. Okay. And I'm just gonna add a little caveat here, which is, okay, honestly, quantum mechanics comes into everything we do. You wouldn't have any semiconducting chips without quantum mechanics because it governs the nature of semiconductors altogether. So I'm not gonna go into like the band structure of a semiconductor and how that's a quantum property because it's beyond the scope of this talk. And here I mostly wanna focus on small devices, but you know, 
actually quantum comes in everywhere. <laughs> okay, so if you're wondering like why the theory, whether the theory is true and is useful, it's used all the time and it works all the time. But today I really wanna talk about when you see specifically wave properties when devices are made very small, okay? So an electron wavelength is about one nanometer. That's a billionth of a meter. And as I mentioned, you know, the wavelength of a person is 10 to the minus 36 meters. And then to give you a sense of scale, the universe is 10 to the 26 meters in diameter. So our wavelength is a factor of, of 10 to the 10 smaller than the universe is large, okay? <laughs> which is really small. Okay, but electrons have a, a huge wavelength of you know, just one nanometer, which you, know, you can actually image these days with advanced imaging tools. Okay, and in the age of nanoelectronics, right, a nanometer is the scale of devices. Devices are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, so, you know, you have your computer and your phones, and the big electronics in your computer and phones are run by little electronics. You know, if you break open your computer, you see a motherboard, a microprocessor, and inside this microprocessor are billions of transistors. Okay, these transistors are the on and off of the computer bit. Right, this is what makes the bit of these little transistors. And you can see the scale, you know, these transistors are at the nanometer scale already. And so there's a lot of research focused on improving these basic transistor elements. And here actually you can see a cross section of a, of, a, of a motherboard, of an integrated circuit. This is actually really cool. This is a vertical cross section of an integrated circuit. Let me see if I can get my laser pointer here. There you go. There you go. It's a little jumpy, but... Um, you can see the cross-section of this integrated circuit where these are the black lines or vias which make contacts going down. And at the very bottom, you have these tiny, tiny transistors. Actually, this is not, my computer is not happy. I'm just going to go back to my arrow. Um, you can see these tiny transistors and, and actually they work, they're, they're you know, lithographically fabricated basically where you have a voltage going from a base to, to a, a, a voltage um, to the base uh, controls whether you have a current flowing from the emitter to the collector, basically. Okay, but they're very, very small at this scale. Um, and in fact, if you've seen Moore's law, which I imagine many of you have, uh, you know, the size of a transistor is having every 18 months. Okay, so to give you a scale of it, you know, an Ebola virus is 80 nanometers. I didn't update this to a coronavirus, but actually coronaviruses are huge. Okay, so that's not even, they're like microns or something. Okay, um, human hairs are 60 microns and a transistor is 50 nanometers. Um, and if you look at, it's kind of small, but if you look at, you know, this is again, another way of looking at Moore's law, as transistors get smaller, we're fitting more and more of them onto our computer chips. So this is what's allowing this processing. You know, now we have something like, you know, 2017, there were 30 billion transistors on a chip. Uh, there are 14 nanometers in diameter. I think we're down to 12 nanometers and a trillion, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of these on, on one chip, okay? So how small can we go, right? If you, if, you, if, you, so if you go back and look at Moore's law, a lot of people think that it's really important to keep transistors getting smaller and smaller and smaller because this is what's keeping progress at some level, right? Now, of course, I think software is a little bloated personally, but okay, even if you reduce software, you still want smaller transistors to get to do more processing. So what are the limits to making transistors smaller and smaller? Well, the limit is quantum mechanics, okay? Because of quantum mechanics, we can't, keep shrinking conventional electronics. And the reason for that is because electrons act as waves, at some point we get down to scales of the wavelength of the electrons and they can no longer be confined and turned on and off. And you can see that visually here. If you look at how we turn on and off the transistors, this is just a, an example of one. Um, you know, you put, you have these gates and you put, you have separate electrons. You put a voltage on one, you, you close it. If there's no voltage, it's closed. And then you add a voltage and it opens and current flows, okay? And that's a very simple way. But what if this zero voltage region is so narrow that it's comparable to the wavelength of electrons, right? Then even with any voltage, you can't turn this thing off. And that's close to where we are today. And in fact, this idea of electrons going through a very narrow barrier like that is called quantum tunneling. It's not as exciting as the quantum tunnel in Ant-Man and, and, the, and the Wasp, but it's a real quantum tunneling thing, right? Electrons, waves can go through, quantum mechanical waves can go through thin classical barriers pretty easily. And so right now we have electrons that can quantum tunnel, right, go through um, the, the off barrier in our transistors, right? And this happens at the five nanometer scale for electrons. And you can see our transistors are getting very close to that scale. And you could say, well, we can add bigger voltages. 
you know, but at some point you have to add voltages that are like hotter, you know, I, I don't know, thousands of volts in order to, in order to turn off these transistors. And if you think your laptop's burning your lap right now, imagine if you had to add thousands of volts to each transistor, it would be, I think someone calculated it would be hotter than the sun. Okay, that's, that's pretty hot. Okay, so, so quantum mechanics is one of the things that's limiting, that limiting new devices, right? A quantum tunneling, a current flows without a voltage. You can't turn it off at low power because of a thin insulator, and you can't run it at high power without overheating. So what are the solutions to this? Well, people have done all sorts of clever, clever things to transistors, spraining them and torquing them and adding new types of materials. But at some point, we reach a place where there aren't any known solutions, and we enter the research realm. The research realm thinks of, rather than using standard transistors, are there new materials that we can use to make transistor type things? And are there new behaviors of these nanostructures that we can use to make different types of computers, like quantum computers? Okay. So in the research that I do, we focus on this research realm with very small nanostructures, um, looking for ultra small, low power dissipation, high sensitivity um, electronics that have maybe novel effects. And here I'll talk about things like graphene, which is a single layer of carbon. We work on that. Um, nanotubes, which is graphene rolled up into a one nanometer tube. Um, topological systems, which are systems that have conducting surfaces and insulating in the bulk. All of these things are, are nanoscale, um, and, but it can also lead to new effects. Okay, so we study these things looking for new type of transistors and new quantum behavior. What do I mean by we study them, right? I'm a, I'm a experimental condensed matter physicist, so what do we do? Well. We look, we do this, we put, we put a battery around it and look at a current and light a light bulb. We don't really light a light bulb, okay? But we really look at these materials as resistors and look at how well the materials conduct electrons and the resistance to flow, right? But the interesting thing here is that classically, if you put just a, a current across a resistor, you get something that's linear with the voltage, that's Ohm's law. But quantum mechanically, you have a wave and, and tunneling and you get very different properties. And I'll show some of those. Okay, so when we measure these, we just measure basically conductance as a function of some variable like temperature, uh, electrostatic gate voltage, magnetic or electric fields. Um, you know, we basically put a fluke across a resistor. It's a complicated fluke with AC lock-in and everything else, but that's a basic measurement. The only other thing we do differently is that if you try to measure quantum effects at room temperature, the thermal energy is much, much bigger than the quantum energy scale. So in order to see the quantum behavior, you have to cool down to very low temperatures. By low temperatures, I mean things like one Kelvin. So, you know, minus 272 Celsius, okay? Or, or even lower, 15 millikelvin, which is 15 milladegrees above absolute zero. Okay, these are very low temperatures, but these are the scales where quantum mechanic effects are, are the largest. And there's a standard way of getting to them by mixing an isotope of helium and then pumping it out using evaporative cooling. You can buy these things for a cool $300,000 and then you've got yourself millikelvin degrees. Okay, and we have, we have three of these in our lab right now. Um, and, so, uh, and so they work, they work well. And I mean, actually, if you ever see pictures of, of IBM or Google's quantum computer, what you'll actually see is one of these pieces of equipment where the quantum computer is a little chip inside there, because they also have to cool those down to millikelvin temperatures. OK, and what's an example of a measurement? Well, I take something like a tube of carbon that's one nanometer in diameter. Right? It looks like this. You can just barely see it in this scanning electron microscope image. Okay? And then I do, like we said, we, we put leads on it. Okay, here's an actual image of the device where we put electrical leads, there's the nanotube, we put electrostatic gate, and then these small, this is, this is okay, this scale is like one mic micrometer, millionth of a meter, and then we, uh, we put it out to bigger leads, we make electrical contact, put it in our cryostat system, and then, and then measure the conductance of it. And what we see are things like this, okay? So this is conductance as a function of a electric field or back gate, and we see peaks. The first thing you notice is this isn't Ohm's law anymore, right? We're just putting a, putting a voltage a, you know, across a device and we see these peaks, which is not linear in, in current and voltage. What this actually is, is quantized conductance peaks from single electrons um, tunneling on and off of the nanotube, right? So it's an electron in the lead, and then depending on the energy scale, it can't get onto the nanotube. You add a little bit of energy and it jumps onto the tube and then it jumps off. So when you get to the quantum scale, you can start seeing these single electron conductance peaks. Um, which can act as sensors and actually these single electron behaviors are, um, can also be used for things like um, quantum computing. Oh, and also, sorry, just to note, this is an example of energy quantization, right? You have single electron energies 
going on and off. So notice the height of the peaks is all about the same because the single, the same energy. Okay, we also look at wave interference effects. In this case, we can take something like a nanotube and we put small barriers at the lead so it acts like a cavity. And then we put electrons and electrons can bounce back and forth and interfere with each other, which they would do if they're waves, right? So light does this, you know that light in a cavity will interfere. But now we put electrons in a conductor and then measure the conductance of that thing, okay? And what we see is this interference pattern. So this is, this is our, um, our current across the device, the function of the energy, the get back wave, the electric field applied to it. And the black is low conductance and the white is high conductance. And if you look carefully, you can see, see these diamond patterns with like a black line in the middle that reproduce themselves, okay? These are interference patterns for the electron bouncing back and forth between the nanotube for an electron wavelength of about 10 nanometers. It's actually Fabry-Perot oscillations, and it shows the electrons are nearly ballistic and interfering even inside a real material. Now, it's not a perfect interference pattern because it's a, it's a real material. It has scattering and all sorts of other things, but you, know, you can easily see interference still um, and show the, and see and visually, you know, experimentally, the wave properties of electrons. Uh, more recently, we've been working on these newly discovered materials called topological insulators. Uh, but as I said, these have insulating bulks and conducting surfaces. And we look at this by looking again at interference of electrons moving around the surface state. So these are like hollow wires and we put a magnetic field through and watch electrons go around the outside. In th which case they should um, have what we called aronoff bohm interference. And then here's actual real data that we measured of conductance as a function of the magnetic field. And you see these clear oscillations here. These oscillations are again, due to constructive and destructive interference of electrons going around the outside of this material. Um, and this was a good experiment for us because it showed that we really had these surface states <clears throat> and there was very little dissipation for it. And these materials are, are proposed to be useful for fault tolerant quantum computing. Okay, so I am nearing the end of the talk. Um, basically what we talked about is some of the basics of quantum mechanics, especially wave particle duality, talk about measuring quantum electronic devices, which is some of the work that I do. See this cartoon where it's asked, how's your quantum computing prototype coming? He says, great, the project exists in a simultaneous state of being both totally successful and not even started. So uh, we, we feel that way quite often. And yet, um, you know, a lot of the work, it may not work, but it's, it's always going to be interesting. And that's, you know, as, as research scientists, that's one of the things that we hope for. Uh, and finally, I just want to acknowledge my, uh, my group, the people who actually do the work, as well as the, the people who fund the research that I do. And thank you very much for your attention. I will take any questions now. Thanks, Nadia. That was a great, really fascinating talk. Uh, does anybody have any questions for uh, uh, Professor Mason, who would like to kick off the <coughs> question period? And you can feel free to unmute yourself. You can also use the chat if you like. So maybe I'll start. Um, so. I didn't actually, I didn't know about this uh, quantum limit that is kind of preventing Moore's law from progressing. Do you see these sort of alternative uh, materials or these techniques that you're reaching, do you see that allowing us to continue the improvement in computer power that Moore's law predicted or do you see computing power stagnating as a result of this theoretical limit? Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting very close to the quantum limit. Now, every year they say they're getting close and they, you know, right now they there's so much money invested in silicon that, that, that companies especially have been very successful in just modifying silicon with materials modification, introducing new materials. Um, you know, at some point we will reach the limit, even with modifications of, of, of silicon. It will come almost definitely in the next 20 years that will come. I think that I think that new materials right now will not replace silicon because silicon is such a well-established industry and has so many things going for it in terms of the ease of production, but they will be used for special applications. So if you need to have a computer that works really well at high frequencies, I think that you can make one out of a different material like graphene or something else. Or if you need a computer that works well under, you know, under a lot of radiation, then you may use a different material. So I think you'll find that computers are becoming more specialized for different applications using different types of transistors rather than our phones incorporating these immediately is, is my guess. Um, yeah, I think that, I do think there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot, 
there's a lot of work to do in terms of software where everyone's been relying on the on the transistors more and more transistors to just build things and i think that we can now go back and 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 maintain a high level of computing by streamlining at the software level not just the hardware level moving forward mm -hmm. um, one thing i didn't talk about in this talk and actually i have it in a longer version of the talk is of course quantum computing so quantum computing uses the quantum mechanical superposition of electrons or any or particles basically photons okay superposition of any particles um so when 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 particles are, are superposed it's kind of like two waves on top of each other right if you have two waves they can either be bigger or smaller or flat or sort of anything in between right but that tells you that, that you can have lots of states just from two particles together so in that sense if you make a bit out of that you can have many many more, more states per bit than you have with just an on or off and that's the idea behind quantum computing using this superposition principle to create many more states that can process much better in parallel billions of times faster in parallel than a classical computer can and so that's another direction that i think the field is trying to move in terms of making quantum computers that can also perform specialized applications better than a, a classical computer even with moore's law continuing ever could right Oh, okay. So uh, we have a question in the chat uh, from Shreyan's Jane. Yeah. Uh, and she asks, actually, I don't know, she or he asks, do you envision a single type of qubit becoming the final logical qubit analogous to the transistor or would different qubits contribute to the field differently? Yeah, this is, this is a great question. So when we talk about, when we talk about qubits, we're talking about a superimposed pair of particles basically, um, which can perform the, the quantum calculate, it's a quantum bit, right? Um, and, and like I said, you can superimpose electrons, you can superimpose ions, you can superimpose atoms, um, you can superimpose superconducting states, uh, where a superconductor is just, a, is a, a superconductor is a pair of electrons and that pair can have different relationships. And that's, that's one way of making a qubit that automatically happens because they're already paired up. And so right now, the, um, I think, most advanced, well, okay, I mean, the, the, the most promising methods right now are, I think, the superconducting qubits and the ions. Um, the answer is, I think, I think that there will be different qubits for different applications, at least in the next 20 to 50 years. Um, superconducting qubits are solid state, so they have a lot of advantages for things that are portable, right? On the other hand, it's, it's hard to um, scale them and maintain coherence among the different bits. On the other hand, if you have ions that you can entangle, that you can make qubits out of, um, these things require lasers to keep them together and to manipulate them. So they require a lot of money and space and lots of different lasers, but they're coherent and you can scale it and maintain coherence over you know, many, many different ions. And so I think if you want something that's gonna do you know, in place computing, you might use that. And if you want something that you can move or that has other applications, you'd use superconductor. So I think at least for the next 50 years, because there's still a lot of fundamental problems that need to be worked out before we can converge on one type or another. You know, if you remember the transistor was, was when was, now I can't remember. I wanna say the transistor was discovered in, in the 40s, 45, I wanna, I wanna Google this, but, but, but basically, you know, the, the transistor was developed in, in I think, the, I mean, in the 50, 57 was a Nobel Prize. Anyway, it was developed in the 40s or 50s. But, you know, you didn't get the personal computers in people's houses until the 80s. You mm -hmm. know, so there was sort of 40 years in there between developing a technique and a technology and having it accessible to the public. Right. Uh, okay. Um... Heather Arnett in the chat asks, can you speak a little more about your outreach initiatives, especially with regards to building accessibility and engagement to concepts that are often perceived as difficult? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, thanks Heather. That's a, so, so yeah, it, it's actually really important to me to, um, to help people understand topics like this, at least at, at a basic, like, you know, quantum is a difficult, is a difficult topic, right? Um, but I think it's important for the public, not just students and graduate students and academics, because academics you think are exposed to it, but also the public are people who are voting on laws relevant to quantum, you know, who are, who are, who are helping, who are, who are the ones who are deciding whether to pay money for it, who are deciding, you know, also things like quantum encryption that could have a long, you know, a long lasting impact on us in terms of just um, you know policies, 
and, and we have to think about the ethics of these things. And so I think it's important for the wider public to really understand to the best of their ability what these topics are to make the best decisions for all of us. Um, so yeah, I, I do. That's why I do things like like Wise Guys. You know, the, it was W is local TV, but I think it's important to just get some cop topics out there. That's why I did things like the TED Talk. Um, in in the center that I run, the Merced, our big focus is science communication because that is really important to me. And so we have people come in twice a year to help our students, faculty, postdocs. Um, get trained in how to better communicate their science from the technical to the non-technical level. Because science communication is a huge aspect of getting the word out to each other and to the broader world um, in terms of what we do. Um, you know, for me personally, I think as a, as a woman of color in academia, I feel like it's also important for people to see that people like me are talking about science, right? Are engaging in this work, that they understand it's not something that's just limited to a few you know, a few people who they might stereotype as a scientist and not consider themselves as, as um, you know, capable of understanding or even in, in a position to understand or make decisions or engage in this field. So I think that, you know, having, having role models out there and having a diverse set of people talk about this is actually really important as well. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, so we have another one in the chat. So this one is going back to the technical side and it's a follow-up from Shreyans. Uh, and the question is, um, so Shreyans wanted to know if error corrected qubits are more important to the field or is the scaling of qubits more important? And also yeah. maybe you could also clarify what qubits are. Yeah, I will. So, so I, I, I would put a slide up, but a, a qubit is a, is a quantum bit. So when we talk about a qubit, what we're talking about are, um, are basically when you have overlapping wavelengths between two particles, okay? And, and the overlapping wavelengths makes them as, their, their properties are entangled together, okay? Not in, a, not in this like a knot that you can't dissociate, but really like two waves that are together and have very, have defined properties, but their properties are combined. And that's, that's the example I was giving before, that when you have these properties that are combined, they can have many more states than just on and off. And so those form a quantum bit, okay? And one of the problems with these quantum bits is that if you're trying to manipulate them, you know, you have to keep their properties defined with respect to each other, even as you manipulate them. Otherwise you can't do a calculation. But these things are so sensitive to the environment that they start kind of drifting apart and developing their own properties because of temperature, because of noise, because of other things as you do manipulations, which means you get errors in your quantum manipulations. And that error coming into the quantum manipulations is one of the biggest problems and why we don't have working quantum computers today. And so to answer the specific question, I think error correction is the biggest problem. Um, well, okay, error correction is the biggest problem for superconducting qubits and scalability is probably the biggest problem for ion qubits. Right? so again, there's different things, but that's where we talk about error correction and the problems with these qubits is, is that because they have these overlapping properties, they have to maintain that even with temperature, noise, and other things coming into play. If that makes sense. That does. Um, so briefly, uh, we're coming toward the end of the session. Um, however, I posted a link for a questionnaire um, that I use to collect demographic information about those who attend the seminars. So if you didn't fill one out last time, um, if you could click on that link and go ahead and fill that out, it only takes five to 10 minutes. Um, it'd be really appreciated and it gives me information about what people are getting out of the seminars and how we can improve them. Um, so the link is in the chat. Uh, we do have time for one other question if anybody has one. I can also give, I have, I have my slide on advice for thriving in STEM if anyone wants it, but that's just me. Oh yeah, that's great. Do you wanna share that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so I've been in this, I've been faculty for 15 years and uh, I've been a, well, I've been in the field for a long time. And I, I wanna say, especially for, well, for everyone, but students especially, STEM isn't, um, you know, be, physics isn't easy and physics is never easy and physics still isn't easy. And, and engineering isn't easy and science isn't easy. Nothing's really easy, right? So, um, but especially in STEM, it's hard. So, and yet I think there's value to it. And I, I hope I could, I hope I showed that I, I think the field is really interesting. I love working in the quantum field. I really love my job. I love the things I do. Um, but in order to make it work for me, I've had to live by certain rules and I've had to be pretty careful about living by these rules to maintain my sense of 
self and, and maintain and maintain my health and my commitment to my family and my interest and values and also be successful in, in physics. And so my advice for, you know, for what I've tried to do in order to, in order to succeed in the way I do is um, one is work hard. There's nothing, there's no substitute for working hard, especially if you feel like you're behind and you don't know a topic, which I felt like most of the time in college and in graduate school, but mostly as an undergraduate, I felt like I just didn't know much about anything. And I felt like I was always behind, but rather than feel like, okay, I'm just not cut out for the field. I just realized until I worked as hard as I could to understand it, I couldn't, I didn't know if I, if I was cut out for the field or not, right? It's not until you work for it that you know if you can do it. And so that's true for everything that you do. Um, so hard work, I try to do what most interests you. So for me, you know, I'm willing to work harder for things that I care about and I like thinking about. If you find yourself not, you know, Again, you don't have to be interested all the time. It's not like I'm 100% interested all the time in physics. Sometimes things are terrible. Like, I don't know, problem sets sucked in college a lot of the time, right? So I didn't leave because it wasn't interesting. But I like thinking about the topic. I, like, I still like reading about the topic. And that's really what drives me at the end of the day and makes me want to do more and work harder. Um, planning ahead and prioritizing. These are, these are my, my, my work-life balance things. You know, as I said, I had two kids during, during the tenure track, um, you know, there's never a good time to do a lot of things, but if you if you think about scheduling and and think about what work you know, how to make things work the best within your situation, then you'll usually do better, right? So I mean, I did this to the extent of even, um, well, anyway, I won't go into details, but yes, you can you can always you can always with, within the confines of what you want to do, you know. Okay, so I, you know, I I actually plan to have my second child to the best of my ability in the winter, so that I could have the winter the winter in the I could have the spring semester plus the summer off rather than mid-semester when I get less time so it doesn't always work but that's the extent to which I try to plan things to make it work for me I knew it was going to be hard and I just wanted a little more time so um, prioritize means you know you have your own values you know what's important to you you should always follow those you know that's what makes for a healthy healthy and happy life you know how do you balance the different things is prioritizing it be healthy um, within all of these things it's important to keep your own mental and physical and spiritual health that's probably the core of everything that we do. And then finally, I always have this mantra of swim in your own lane. And this I, I got from someone else who, who, uh, who gave a story about a swimmer who was always coming in second in races. And he said to his coach, you know, I, I feel like I'm good, but someone always gets there ahead of me. And the coach said, that's because when you swim, you're always looking to your left and always looking to your right. And you're never looking ahead at your goals and your finish line. And I feel that way a lot, you know, especially those of us who are you know, underrepresented in the field and have more challenges or have a different background, you know, there's always that feeling of people around us saying things and looking around and seeing what's going on. And I, for me, it's been the most helpful to really focus on my values and my priorities and the things I want to learn and I want to do and try to block out the rest of the noise. And that's really what's motivated me the whole time. So swim in your own lane. Um, that's it. That was very quick, but that was my uh, my life advice for for thriving in STEM. Great. Uh, well, that's uh, very well said, and um, I'd like to thank you again for uh, participating in the seminar. That was a really great talk, really good advice, really good insight. Um, I do hope you'll uh, continue to uh, attend the future seminars along with everybody in the audience. I hope that you guys will be back. Um, so pay attention to. Uh, the webpage, which will have updates on uh, upcoming seminars. It's not scheduled yet, but I expect the next seminar to take place in early April. Uh, so uh, we have all your email information, so we will be reaching out to you. Uh, so thanks again, Professor Mason, and uh, thanks to everybody for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.